This is the Forbes Books Podcast, conversations with remarkable folks who are impacting the world of business and beyond. Hola, I'm Joe Partavilla, and my guest this week is proof that entrepreneurship can make a positive impact on communities across America. His name is Joel Holland, and you might know him as the founder of Storyblocks, the first and largest subscription-based platform that provides stock video and images. But he's currently the CEO of Harvest Hosts, a service that connects RVers with unique overnight camping experiences at local businesses like wineries, farms, museums, and more. Through Harvest Host, Joel has helped nearly 5,000 small businesses generate new revenue streams by inviting RVers to visit their locations. But beyond all those numbers, Joel is dedicated to creating win-win partnerships between the folks who are driving the RVs and small towns. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Yo, thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to chat. Yeah, me too. And so I want to give you a little context in terms of RVing. I don't know much about it, but I do know this really weird factoid. So my uncle lives out in Nevada, and a about a year ago, he had this dream of buying an RV, and he was going to drive across the country and visit me here in Charleston, South Carolina. So I was like, cool. And I said, how, how many stops is that? You know, you know probably you know two or three stops along the way. And I'm like, so where do you stop? And he goes, Wally World. I'm like, what? He goes, Walmart. I'm like, Walmart, what? He goes, yeah, Walmarts allow RVs to park. I guess not all, but some Walmarts allow RVs to park in their parking lot overnight, and then they can go and leave and do whatever they want. And and, and my brain like hurt from this. I'm like, wait a minute. How does a major corporation take on this massive liability of having people sleep on their parking lots? So before we go any further, Joel, is this some sort of hack that my uncle came upon, or is this something that's commonly known amongst the RV community? Yeah, no, it, it's commonly known, and they do call them Wally Worlds. It's funny. That's like the insider's nickname for for, for boondocking at a, at a Walmart. There are no hookups or anything. You basically park in the parking lot. It used to be much more common. What's starting to happen is a lot of Walmarts are cracking down on it for liability reasons. They're finding it's just not, uh, it's not worth it their time. But um, Walmart Cracker Barrel, those are the two parking lots people think about spending the night in. And it's funny because I've, you know, I've been RVer now 10 years, thousands of nights. I've never once had any desire to park in a parking lot, in a Walmart parking lot. I love Walmart, <laughs> love shopping there, love buying stuff there. You can get organic produce in any part of the country, but I don't want to spend the night there. Interesting. And so you mentioned the fact that you've been RVing for 10 years. I didn't even know that you could verb RV, but you've been RVing it for 10 years. To me, full disclosure, Joel, that does not sound appealing to me at all. Like driving for extended periods. It could have something to do with my wife is a very kind of annoying backseat driver. Don't tell her I told you that. So the idea of like excessive driving seems like a lot. So that's maybe me just projecting. But what got you into it? Like what was like your uh, sort of like aha thing, like I want to just get in this big old box and drive around the country. You know, the interest in RVing started not because of RVing itself, but because I was so dissatisfied with kind of where I was in life uh, at the time. And so in, in I was living in DC, um, had been running a company there for 10 years. It was a great company, great, great employees, nothing, you know, nothing wrong there, but I was just tired of being in a city. I just felt really like discontent. And my girlfriend, my wife now, girlfriend at the time, uh, she felt something kind of similar. And it, it, one day it just kind of culminated in this like discussion where we're like, we got to get out of here. Like we, we love going to the mountains and from DC, we'd go to Shenandoah Valley quite a bit. We loved camping. We loved hiking. We were, it, we found that we were always trying to escape. That was really what it came down to is we were always trying to get out of the city to go somewhere to feel good. And we had this thought of like, well, why don't we just try like doing that. Like, let that happen. Like, why are we stifling this concept? And then it relatively impulsively happened that we went to a wedding in Manassas, Virginia, which is like on your way out towards Shando Valley. Did this wedding for one of my best friends. It was lovely. The Sunday after the wedding, we're hungover, really feeling the Sunday scaries because we didn't want to go back to the city. There was an RV dealership nearby. And, and really impulsively, we're like, let's just go check out this RV thing. We knew nothing about it. We weren't RVers. We'd never done it as kids, either one of us. So we drove over and started walking through these units. And we were like, holy cow, these are little houses on wheels. They've got everything. They've got the bed, the kitchen, a little fake fireplace, recliner chairs, a television. And you can just drive into the woods and have a home with you. Cool. 
So, so it kind of sparked this idea of we could hit the open road, be free, but have a controlled environment. So we don't have to, you know, look, we can't live in a tent forever. That would be too much. We're certainly not going to go stay in like, you know, rundown motels because I'm too afraid of bed bugs. But if we can control the environment, maybe we can have our cake and eat it too. So that was, that was the, the idea. And, and we jumped on it impulsively. We bought the RV pretty much right then and there. Uh, and it was a trailer. Didn't even have a truck to pull it. Bought the thing. And I was like, <laughs> hey, I got to come back because I have no way to take this home. <laughs> and then I had to go find out how to buy a truck. But that, that's what really kicked it off. It wasn't RVing itself. It was the idea that we wanted to chase kind of freedom of the open road. Wow. And I know your background's in tech and we're going to get into that. But your tech bros and people that know you, when you had this idea of jumping into an RV and driving across country, did people like do a 5150 hold where there was there doctors involved were they nervous did they think you were going through like a midlife crisis early what was what, what was the reaction in your inner circle yeah because at the time and this is 20 it was october 2013 when we bought this thing and these days rving has become much more mainstream right on both ends of the spectrum but even young people are doing it and so back then it wasn't like that it really wasn't the cool thing and so this was weird and so to a lot of people they were kind of like huh, this guy must be like really burned out. And I was. And so they were accurate, right? Like I was at kind of a low point in life where I was burned out and needed something different. No one really judged it, I don't think. I mean, maybe they judged it and shouldn't tell me. <laughs> you don't that's know, they, Joel, they yeah, were. That's <laughs> good point. That's a really good point. They probably <laughs> judged it. Um, but I think that they also kind of supported this idea of, hey man, whatever you need to do, go do it. And and so it, um, yeah, friends and family, you know, all, all from, you know, from what they were saying, we're on board and we started just taking these weekend trips that very quickly turned into let's hit the road. And we ended up RVing through all the lower 48 states over the course of two years. And for parts of those, you know, two years, it was almost almost full time. Um, and, and and ultimately drove out to Colorado and, and impulsively bought a house in Vail. And then we've been here for seven years. So we're, we're very impulsive people. I've noticed that, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's funny, you talked about being an RVer before it was quote unquote cool. When did that shift happen that you saw and then obviously probably spurred you on to get involved with the uh, Harvest Host? But w was there a turning point or was it so just sort of a gradual progression that you noticed that you're like, oh, more and more like the hip kids are RVing or, or buying an Airstream or something like that? Well, when did you realize something like that was happening? It started happening naturally in like 2015, 16. It felt like there was just this movement towards just authentic, right? So it was like what we were starting to see among younger people was they were they were they were swapping out buying things for buying experiences, and they wanted to buy local, they wanted to buy organic, they wanted like and, and so really the road trip embodied a lot of those things. It's you know it was a cool experience. It was not mainstream, which I think a lot of you know younger people were looking for the non-mainstream option, which was like RVing was 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 weird, and so that made it kind of cool. Um, and you got to go visit these little towns that you would never see. There were typically flyover towns, right? And now you can go drive to them, go to the antique shop that you never would have seen, go eat your avocado toast at a cool like refurbished cafe, go to the microbrewery just opened up. So like, I think a lot of these trends and microbreweries being one of them started just kind of picking up steam over you know, 2015, 16, 17, 18. It just happened and RVing followed it. And then of course, COVID hit. And COVID put it into another drive, right? It it it, it took RVing and it just like had a pull to it. I think it was pulling forward demand. I think that you know naturally people were getting back to this idea of the Great American Road Trip, but COVID certainly kicked it into gear. And what kind of role? And I feel that I'm answering my own question, but I'm asking anyway. Like, how big a role has social media played in this? Because of the fact that people can now share these sweeping vistas of middle America. The cool kid from Brooklyn is now somewhere in Montana and he's uploading photos of these amazing sunsets. What, 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 tell me about the impact of social media on, on the world of RV. Yeah, it wouldn't be what it is without social media. That's absolutely true because um, RVing is a very visual thing. And, and it, well, it's, it's two things. One, it's very visual and two, everyone wants to talk about it, right? So, so like, Unlike a vegan who wants to talk about it all the time, they don't have all the photos. An RVer wants to talk about it all the time and they have the photos to share. <laughs> so like, and so Facebook for us specifically was the catalyst 
that made everything explode. We know our members join, they go have an amazing time staying at a vineyard at sunset by their rig, sipping wine. They want to take that photo and they want to tell everybody about it because it's a really cool experience. So yeah, social media um, was was the vessel. They got the word out. Cool. And before we jump into Harvest Host and how you got involved with it, I know your your background is obviously in tech. You founded Storyblocks, which I'm a proud Storyblocks customer now for three years going. So thank you for creating a pretty cool product there. And then you kind of said, hey, listen, somebody write me a big check. I'm going to go do something else. Why did you know after you're probably, probably doing pretty good, probably doing pretty good at your time, Joel, why was Harvest Host that thing that was driving you? Because obviously, well, part of the pun too, uh, why was it that you, you wanted to connect your life and your business together? Yeah. The short answer, and then I'll elaborate, is I'm the kind of person that needs some sort of purpose in order to have fun. And, and, and so what I, you know, with Storyblocks, wonderful company, it was a 10-year overnight success story, you know, built it up, sold it to a great private equity firm. I was really quite burned out by the end. Like it was just, I had done the same thing for a long time. And even though it was a great product, like I didn't want to talk about stock media anymore. And so um, it was the right time to move on, hand the baton, got the check, like you said, and that kind of like gave us the freedom to travel. And we started moving about and we that gave us the freedom to come to Vail and buy a house. And my thought was, without overthinking it, all right, I was really burned out on work. Let's play for a bit, right? Let's just have some fun. Like I, I'm a huge skier. I'm like, I want to ski every day. And then when I'm not skiing, I want to be camping, dirt biking, off-roading, whatever, right? Like I'm just going to play so hard. <laughs> and and I did that and it was awesome for like one year. And, and then it was like a vacation that was going on a little too long. And I started feeling pretty gluttonous. And the weird thing is, and I guess it's like the analogy of vacation or drinking too much, you know, in moderation, awesome. When you do it too much, you just don't feel good about it. And it lost its luster. And all of a sudden I was really getting into a tough spot because I'm like, this is bad. I live in like what I think is the most beautiful part of the world. I can ski every day. I can drink wine every night. I can camp and I have no responsibilities. This should be epic and awesome. And instead I feel, I just, it's, it's not right. And, and so that like, I was like, okay, I need to do something else. Clearly, like I, you know, and I'd never thought I was going to retire. I was too young to retire, but it was interesting how quickly I felt that urge to do something else. And so then there was this question of like, well, what next? And I started exploring, you know, I, I'll put it this way. Eyes are wide open. So for the next year, I was really kind of enjoying this idea of everywhere I traveled, everywhere I went, I was looking at business opportunities and just looking at my, yeah, I was like, cool, someone made a bunch of money off of this. What an interesting idea. And like, what's my next thing? Um, it reminds me of the movie Cocktail with Tom Cruise, where they like look at the zipper and he's like, X, Y, Z, someone's making millions of dollars off this little zipper, right? Like <laughs> there's business opportunities everywhere. That was fun for a year until it wasn't fun. And what made it not fun was I didn't find my next idea. And all of a sudden, I now had this compounding issue of I can't just play all day because that's lost its luster. I want to do the next thing, but I can't figure out what it is. Holy cow, am I a one trick pony? Did I get super lucky building story blocks? I just, you know, that was it. And now for the next 60 years of my life, I'm just going to be adrift <laughs> and miserable, right? Like, and maybe miserable is the wrong word, but at least a drift. And that started getting really stressful. I, and I, I did all these like challenges where like 30 days, I'd like write down a business idea every day. I journal about it. And I was like, something's going to stick. Something's going to click. And nothing did. Uh, and then I did, I guess, what a lot of people do who are trying to find love. I said, you can't force love. You got to step back. And I stopped trying to force it. And instead I said, like, what are the things I enjoy doing already? And let's make a little Venn diagram. And RVing was a big thing. Like, that was a big interest of mine. And then, of course, with Storyblocks, my expertise was in stock media, but I wasn't doing that again. But as part of that, it was memberships, online marketing, um, and, and, and selling a digital product. And so like, I was like, okay, can I find a way to line RVing up with that? And that's my Venn diagram. It's a new industry, but it overlaps with something I understand. Then my 30-day challenge became, let's look for businesses in the RV world that have a membership component to them. And every day for 30 days, I would do something that, that I felt moved me forward on that path. And one of those days was a Saturday where I didn't really feel like doing this exercise, but I made myself do it. I found this company, Harvest Hosts. 
by researching RV membership programs in little niche communities, right? So I was just kind of looking at the forums and reading about what people are into. And I was like, woo, that's cool. It's a membership where you can stay overnight at wineries, farms, breweries. Neat. So I reached out to the founders and just said, hey, um, I love this concept. Would you ever think about selling this company? And that kicked off this three-month conversation uh, that started with the answer, no, we don't want to sell it. It's a lifestyle business. We like it. But who are you and, and what's your offer, right? Um, and then by the way, the phrase, because I've now bought multiple companies and I found that the best opener that always gets a response no matter what is, hey, Joe, I really like your business. Would you be interested in selling it for the right price? No matter how uninterested a person thinks they are, when you say for the right price, they have to know what that price is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and you will get a response and you will get a discussion and 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 hopefully you can also eventually find something that works for both of you which is what happened with Harvest Hosts. We found a price that works for them. And I'm curious about the idea of acquisition because you you mentioned you you founded Storyblocks. Why was acquisition more viable or or uh, interesting to you than just starting another company? Let's do it again. Did it once, do it again. Starting companies is really hard. And that's like the, that's the <laughs> overstatement of the ray of the century. Um, but it really is because you've got to have so many stars aligned, right? You've got to have a good idea. Then you've got to find product market fit. Then you got to get the price right. Then you got to tell everybody about it and convince them to buy it. There's so many things that have to happen that going ground up, or as Peter Thiel says, zero to one is just really hard. Now, what I learned over 10 years is there are certain things I was pretty good at. And maybe coming up with a product idea is like, maybe I'm okay at that. But what I was really good at was scaling a business. It was taking a product that already had product market fit and then selling it, figuring out how to market that online, price it properly, do all the testing, and then really just go blitz. And, and so when it came time to this you know, next business, like you know, life, that was kind of part of my decision. It was like, why not try to shortcut the process and do the things I'm good at and enjoy doing and that was in, and by the way, this was all just a thesis. And so when I bought Harvest Host, I wrote all this down. I'm like my thesis is I buy a company that I, that I love the space on, that I have some expertise in, and I'm going to apply everything I learned over 10 years. I'm going to try to consolidate it and see if I can apply it and grow it fast. And it was just a guess, but it actually worked. It really did work. And, and I think it took five years to 100X the business. Wow. I never could have taken the business from, you know, sub a million to, to 30 million in that short of a time frame, if I built it from the ground up, because it had taken the founders 10 years to build the original network, right? So they built an amazing idea. And then I was able to just take a great idea and get it to the public. Wow. All right, I'm going to try to sound smart here because you mentioned earlier about the fact that there's like a million full-time RVers. And so I'll use a businessy term here. What was the addressable market? Because I mean, there's only X number of people that are going to do this on the regular. You, you, you come to find out that there is a market, but did you know that there would be this much of a market that you could 10x in five years? Yeah, 100x in five years. Oh, and, sorry. And, and, yeah, <laughs> and extra decimal point. And, right. and, and, and so, no, I didn't think I could 100x it, but I was confident I could at least 10x it. And the advantage of being a part of this niche community was that I knew the data on the market. And this is something I often tell friends. Like when they're looking at businesses, it's much better to like, go deep into something you're interested in and really learn about the world. So then if you try to build a business within it, you already know what you know. you know. And so what I knew was RVing was really cool. And by the way, there are 12 million RV owners in the United States and that 10% of households own one. It's massive. Wow. $150 billion industry. And nobody knew that except for me because I was in it, right? Like it's like the biggest small niche industry ever. Uh, and so- I didn't know COVID was going to happen. It was going to grow so fast. Yeah, I wish that you would have told somebody if you did. Totally. That, that would have been a dick move. Yeah, yeah. I would have, I would have like, I would have done RVs and face masks, right? Like, I would have like <laughs> crushed the face mask business. But, but yeah, no, it like, I didn't know that was going to happen, but I knew it was a big addressable market, and that's a good point. Like, I think anytime you're starting thinking about a business, you got to think about like, how big can this get? What am I trying to build? And by the way, you don't always have to build the biggest business. I'm not trying to build a billion dollar business here. I don't think that's in the cards. I was trying to build a really good business for the market. And and so knowing your addressable market is really important. And uh, I think you you know my boss, Adam Witte, and he always says that the riches are in the niches. Like find that thing and excel in and just blow it out from there. How do you toe the line of something that's 
too niche because yeah. I mean, obviously you were in that world, but maybe there wasn't any kind of growth. It was just, it was what it was, you know, who knew again with COVID and all that other stuff, but th- were you ever worried that it's like, Oh man, maybe this is too niche a thing that I'm getting involved with. First of all, I love that. I love that the riches are in the niches. I, unfortunately I pronounce it niche. So it's like, it doesn't work as well, Okay, but, but <laughs> no, but your point is really spot on because one of the things I thought about, and this is how I think you should think about buying a business. You hope you can improve it and grow it. But worst case scenario, you should accept that you won't mess it up. And that's what I accepted. I was like, I can buy Harvest Hosts and I'm at least confident enough to know that I won't screw it up. Meaning that whatever they're currently doing, let's just assume I do that forever. Well, I paid 5X EBITDA, right? Which was, you know, that that was the negotiation. It was like, figure it out. Even though if it had never grown a dime past what I purchased it, that's a 20% return a year. That's fantastic. It was much better than any other 20% return I could get. And I would be doing something I enjoyed, right? And I think that's how a lot of people who buy franchises think, right? Like you're going to pay an EBITDA multiple three to five. And if you're paying a five, you're effectively getting a 20%. In five years, you're going to return your investment and everything past that is profit. And so that that was kind of that was my minimum expectation was I won't screw it up. My goal was to try to improve it, and I and I luckily I did. But but that then that became the like let me layer on these things that I think I'm good at: online marketing, pricing, memberships, and that's where bringing some expertise to the table can help you take it an existing business hopefully to the next level. Hmm. And as you know from your experience at Storyblocks and now Harvest Host, every company known to man wants to have that subscription model. Whether you deserve to be one or not, everything's got to be a subscription. Now, Wall Street only looks at subscription numbers, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill, Joel. So yeah. talk to me about Harvest Host subscription model, how it works, and why it's so successful. Yes. So it is funny. You know, subscriptions are wonderful. They're sexy. They're awesome, right? Like, because you acquire a person, you learn over time on average how long people stick around. Therefore, you know, lifetime value. And then you acquire people for less than that and you're effectively arbitraging. And if you can get them to stick around long enough because you have a good product, you're now cohort stacking. So you bring in a thousand people and actually you're bringing 2000, they just stack and stack and stack. And hopefully the bucket doesn't leak too much. That's how you build a big business. You don't have to continue killing to eat, right? That's why subscriptions are sexy. I think that like you said, people try to then force them upon a lot of stuff where they shouldn't be, right? Like I like I buy boxers from a company. They try to give me a subscription to boxers. I don't need a subscription to boxers. Guess what? When I need boxers, I'll buy boxers. I don't need a subscription. This is ridiculous. Right. Right. So so don't overfit the subscription. That's lesson number one. Um, it won't work because you'll just have bad churn, right? And then churn turns all good. So with Harvest Hosts, it's a very simple model. You pay $100 a year to be a member of our club. And then as a member... You can stay at close to 8,000 really cool locations all over North America, from wineries to breweries to farms, museums, et cetera. There's no charge to stay overnight. You have to be in our club in order to get access to these places because they trust us and they trust our members. And the reason the membership is so cheap is that our members are going to patronize the business they visit. So if you go to a winery, you're probably going to do a wine tasting, buy a bottle or two. On average, our members do spend when they visit these small businesses. And this year, our members will spend over $50 million directly with our hosts. So that's why the hosts are interested. They're getting a lot of new business from a really cool group of people. Travelers tend to be really fun and nice. And then we make all of our member- money from the membership. That's it. Like every dollar is from the membership. And we, we, at this point, have a quarter million members. Wow. That's awesome. And in terms of growing that base of, of places you can park your vehicle in, how does regulations and the man get involved here? Because I'm sure there are some establishments that would love to do Harvest Host be a host, but their city or town would be like, "Uh uh-uh, you can't have people parking overnight in your establishment. How complex is that sort of web that you got to get through? Yeah, it's a constant navigation. Um, You know, luckily we work, you know, we work in all 50 states and and just like tens of thousands of municipalities. Every municipality has different rules. One thing I would say in general is that local governments want to support their small businesses. And so the nice thing with our model is that all we're doing is saying we're going to bring more business to the small businesses that are already zoned for business. You know, the only unique part is that we're allowing our members to spend the night parked, you know, at their property. 
but there are no hookups. This isn't camping. They're not paying for camping and it's only 24 hours. So it's really not an unreasonable ask in return for supporting the local economy, right? So then the businesses make money, the local towns get tax revenue, the, the RVers end up buying groceries and other things. So they actually get quite a lot of stimulus from our members. It's a good thing. Now, occasionally we do have issues we have to iron out. And this goes back to the discussion about California. In California, unfortunately, in some places, they've blanket banned RVs because it was the easiest way for them to get rid of this problem of squatters. And so they couldn't discern. It's hard to discern between an RVer who's a squatter and an RVer who's a traveler. So they just said no RVs. That's tough to navigate. Luckily, it's not a very common problem. But but yes, that these things happen. But what we, the nice thing is we tell anybody listening, if you own a business and you have a room for RVers to park, that's all that we're allowing them to do. They come with their own water, their own power. They're, they're a self-contained unit. They have their own bathroom and they're going to support your business. And by the way, it's free to be in our program. So if you're a host, we don't charge our hosts anything. So you know Joe's, you know Joe's delicatessen, you know delicatessen, you're a member for free. You'll make an average of fifteen thousand dollars extra a year from our members, and hopefully you meet some nice people. Wow! And it's only one night stays at all these locations. That's right. That's right. Yep. What if they wanted to stay like, to, you know, say multiple nights in the same city? Would they be able? I mean, I'm assuming they would just go from one harvest house to another kind of thing because they can't do back to back nights. Yeah, they could totally do that. And, and a lot of, and we have now, because we have 8,000 locations, our density is high, right? And so you think about, like, so you're in Charleston, beautiful place, by the way. We have a lot of amazing hosts around you. And, and I would say you could probably go night to night. What our, our, our members typically do is go to a couple hosts and then go to a campground, an actual campground. And then they can plug in, get their power dump their sewer, right? And then take off and then go to another host. Nice. And what's your vetting process for these hosts? I'm assuming there's like an application. Do you guys, how does that all work? Because people want to know they're going to a place that's legit, safe, and they could have a good time there as well. Yeah, totally. So it is an application process, but a very simple application. You essentially fill out a form. You have to be a licensed business. So that's important. You know, you have to kind of self-certify that you've got a place for RVs to park safely, you know, and somewhat scenically, right? Like it can't be, you know, by a dumpster, you know, behind on the highway, right? Then our team will actually go through the, the, the applications. They'll pull up Google Earth and try to get an actual idea of the location. If it meets certain criteria, other criteria includes, you know, social media pages where we can actually go make sure this is a business that people like. Then we let them in the program and we let our members decide. We'll basically say, you know, it's kind of probationary, like these, here's a new host. And our members rate the hosts. And our hosts rate the members too. But but that's how we quickly learn how much our members like a place. And if they hate it, you know, much like an Uber driver who's no good, then we part ways. But I'm happy to report that rarely happens. And let's get into your entrepreneurial journey here to wrap things up because you mentioned that in your first rodeo with Storyblocks after about a decade, you were burnt out. What steps are you doing now at Harvest Host to prevent that from happening again. Obviously, now you're more of an experienced RVer, so you probably just go drive somewhere to the end of the earth. But like, what are you doing to make sure that Joel Holland doesn't have another nervous breakdown and all his family gets worried about him because he's going to do something crazy? That's right. What's next, right? Yeah. <laughs> Buy a sailboat and sail around the moon. I don't know. Um, so the thing I did differently this time, very intentionally, was to think about what I loved at Storyblocks, what I loved doing, and what I hated doing. And what I loved doing was more the product and marketing stuff. I loved the product. I loved building the product. I personally am a, a videographer. I love shooting and I love distributing it. And I loved marketing it. It just felt so good to get the product in the hands of people like you. What I didn't like was the day-to-day -day minutia of HR and hiring and discussions around issues, right? And like the bigger a company gets, the more fires there are to put out, right? There's just things that pop up. I hated that stuff. And my mistake was at Storyblocks, I dealt with too much of it for too long before I brought on the right team to really like take over. And, and it got to a point where I was just so like tired of it that I kind of, I brought on the right team and then I walked away and they did a great job and they built this amazing business. And to this day, it's a great business. This time at Harvest Hosts, I, I said, I'm not doing that again. So I brought the right team on first. <laughs> like as soon as I started, I brought on people and we have an amazing COO. We have an amazing CFO, head of engineering. You know, we have a head of HR. We, you know, we have 60 employees now. So actually not too dissimilar from the size where I was totally burned out at Storyblocks. This time I'm not burned out at all because my day-to-day -day is thinking about the product and thinking about how to get it into the hands of people 
to enjoy it while also visiting a bunch of these locations myself, right? But I don't deal with any of that other stuff. And, and I was just always intentional about it. Best analogy I can give on the home front, we have two cats. I've never cleaned the litter box. And it's because my wife really wanted two cats. And I said, look, I'm okay with cats, but I'm never going to clean a litter box. Let's set some expectations up front. And now we've been together for like 13, 14 years. No problems, no muss, no fuss. But it was because we set those expectations up front. So that's the, that's the key in business, I think, is know what you like doing and try to hire people to do the other stuff because they're going to do a better job anyway. And then you won't get burned out. That's awesome. All right. And lastly, Joel, for someone who's listening to this and, and they're like, wow, I thought RVing was weird, but now this actually kind of you know, sounds kind of fun. What's a good first step for someone who wants to dive into the Joel Holland world of RVing across the country or maybe just doing like a, a trip or two? What, what, do you, what, what would you suggest to someone? Maybe someone like me who has no interest whatsoever, but maybe after chatting with you, I'm like, yeah, it sounds like fun. What, what, are, what are some baby steps to do so you're not just sinking like your life savings on an RV and then it's sitting in your driveway? Yeah, totally. And you know, the, the cool thing these days, there are two peer-to-peer -peer rental marketplaces that you can go to to get exactly the unit you want to try out. It's outdoorsy and RV share. Gone are the days of having to go get some crappy rental unit. You can literally go on these, these they're like, it's like Airbnb. You go on and go, I want a Sprinter van, right? Or I want a Class A, a big diesel pusher, I want a bus, whatever it is, you can find it, you can rent it, go have the experience. I would encourage you to, in addition to hitting campgrounds, you know, sprinkling some harvest host locations. Obviously. Obviously, I'd be remiss. But yeah, that's the thing. You can try it. You can try it before you buy it, or you can simply try it, right? You can just go out and rent it and make that a cool experience. I guarantee it'll be fun no matter what. I would encourage everybody to do it. it the ro road tripping is amazing. You know, there are so many cool towns and places that you can really only get to by vehicle, and you really only want to stay in, in an RV. That's awesome. His name is Joel Holland. He is the CEO of Harvest Host. Joel, thanks so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Hey, man, this is fun. Thank you. You're welcome. And you can find out more about Joel's company at harvesthost.com. And that'll do it for another episode of the Forbes Books Podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe. That way you'll get new episodes as soon as they're available. And if you have a spare moment, I'd greatly appreciate it if you could leave a review, which will help other exceptional folks like you discover the show. You can always connect with me on X, LinkedIn, and Instagram at Joe Partavilla. And please don't forget the golden rule and treat others as you want to be treated. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Adios.